The topic of my lesson today is how the church reacts to culture and the influence that culture has on the body of Christ. I'd like to read a passage of scripture. Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, verses one and two. Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Probably one of the more famous books that has tried to categorize how various groups within Christendom have attempted over the years to deal with the influence of culture which is another word for the world, the influence of culture or the world, the influence or pressure of culture on the church is a book by Richard Niebuhr entitled Christ and Culture. In this book, Niebuhr describes five main approaches that have been used to try to resolve the problem of Christ and by extension, Christians and the church, and how they deal with the pressure of culture. The enduring problem, according to the author, was the following. In what way does the perfect and sinless Christ sanctified church coexist with a sinful fallen world culture? How does Christ deal with culture? How is this practically accomplished? In other words, how does the church live in the world, but not become part of the world? In his book, Niebuhr explains five ways that Christians have traditionally dealt with this dilemma, and I'd like to kind of describe these five very briefly, not to go into too much detail, but give you the five ways that historically Christians have tried to deal with culture, according to him. The first is Christ against culture. Now when Niebuhr talks about culture, he means the total process of human activity. What humans have actually superimposed on nature, like farming and commerce, art, society, war, so on and so forth. In the view described as Christ against culture, he refers to those who deal with the in the world, not of the world dilemma by rejecting culture altogether. A clear line is drawn between the brotherhood of the children of God and the world at large. For example, the clearest example would be those who live as monks you know, in monasteries, completely reject the world or groups who refuse to use modern appliances as a way of rejecting the influence of culture, like the Amish, for example. The problem here, of course, is that you can never really separate yourself from culture completely. Any group or system you establish to separate yourself from culture becomes its own culture with its own strengths and, and corruption. I know this from experience because I've spent time in Catholic monasteries when I, was a, when I was a Catholic. So I understand there is a culture that exists within a monastery, a very definitive culture. The best you can do is to freeze culture in some kind of time warp. In the end, the Christ against culture approach fails to completely set you apart. Another approach that has been tried, he calls the Christ of culture. In this approach, Christ is seen as the fulfillment of all that is good in culture. Let me explain what he means by that. People with this view tend to see Christ as the leader of their nation and their culture as the Christian culture. This is a predominant view here in the United States post World War I. One nation under God, we're a Christian nation. 
The problem here is that Christ is not the embodiment of a culture or a political nation. He is the head of a spiritual body, which is the church. Although sincere, this view is inadequate when considering the many cultures in the world. We here in America know well, you know, in the Civil War, North and South, you know, both North and South claimed Christ as the head of their particular uh, movement at the time. Another one he describes, Christ above culture. This position holds that there shouldn't be any tension between culture and Christ. The problem is between man and God. Culture is the backdrop against which this is played out. And culture is where the church reveals Christ to the world with acts of grace. The social gospel, for example, or liberation theology or Methodism, all of these see Christ above culture and not in conflict with culture. Niebuhr finds a problem with this approach in that it easily leads to institutionalization. For example, denominationalism, uh, hierarchy in church organization, multiplication of parachurch organizations. Uh, when the gospel serves to save the human condition instead of the human soul, we're not representing the true Christ of the Bible or his message. Christ did not come to save culture. He came to save souls. Uh, a fourth approach that he describes, Christ and culture in paradox. This approach recognizes that there is a tension that exists between Christ and culture. That the church is redeemed and spiritual in nature, but because of the flesh, very much part of the culture that we inhabit. This view very much resembles the mindset that Paul describes in Romans chapter seven and eight, where he argues that even though he continues to struggle with the sin or the culture of his humanity, there is nevertheless no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I personally tend to identify most with this point of view, that the issue of Christ and culture is one of ongoing tension between the church and the world, and the solution for both is Christ. For me, he continues to reassure me of my salvation despite my culture, despite my worldliness. For the world, he invites all to be free from the condemnation sure to come because of culture. I also agree with Niebuhr that this position tends to lead to indifference and isolation if we're not careful. For example, indifference because we tend to see no redeeming of culture and therefore we make little effort to relieve its suffering and injustice. Isolation because this is a minority position that neither denounces society or tries to save it. So it relegates its proponents to the fringes without much influence. And you know what? That's us. That's who we are, the Church of Christ. Uh, you know, if you ever notice, if you, if you were to take a thousand churches and look at their budgets, you would notice that the least amount of money spent in any of those thousand budgets is for benevolence. We're not interested in saving the world. We're not interested in fixing the world. We're interested in getting people out of the world. And it shows. Number five, just a passing thought. Number five, Niebuhr uh, describes Christ, the transformer of culture. Another way that Christians try to deal with this Christ and culture uh, tension here. This was Niebuhr's preferred position. This group can be called con conversionists who have a more hopeful view of culture. This view suggests that culture is part of God's creation and so it is subject to his grace. The church's role is to Christianize culture to the glory of God. Every believer going into politics, every contemporary Christian entertainer, every Christian businessman social club or group operates with this view in mind, whether they acknowledge it or not. My objection to this approach is that it doesn't take into account what the Bible says about culture and the church's role in the world. You see, Paul didn't say uh, that Christ lit up the domain of darkness, Colossians 1.13. 
He said, he delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. We're not here to Christianize the world. We're here to call people out of the world because the world is going to be destroyed. I don't believe that the Bible teaches that we are to Christianize uh, society. I, I'm persuaded that we are here to proclaim Christ to the world. And this is a completely different thing. So there you have a very brief summary of some of the approaches used to deal with the effect that culture, any culture, has on the church. Briefly to review, Christ against culture, the Christ of culture, the Christ above culture, Christ and culture in paradox, Christ the transformer of culture. Now, remember that I said that Christians cannot divorce themselves from culture. There is no culturalist gospel. The church is always culturally embedded somehow. The war is not against culture per se. This is too general a statement. It's against those aspects of culture that contradict the divine will of God. Things like violence in culture, pride in culture, injustice, disbelief, lust, idolatry, racism, hatred. Those are the things in culture that are against the gospel of Christ, that we're against, that uh, exist within culture. The world will always have culture that changes at times for better or for worse and puts pressure on the church in various ways. Listen carefully. Our task is to maintain the culture of Christ in the church not in the world. I'll repeat it. Our task is to maintain the culture of Christ inside of the church, not in the world. And this is important because maintaining the culture of Christ in the church enables the church to carry out its mission to every culture in every generation. Uh, to seek and save the lost, Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Uh, to witness against evil, John 16, verse eight and nine. To warn about the judgment to come, Hebrews 12, verse 25. That's the message of the church. That's our job. That's what we're here to do. Sure, we got to have soup lines. Sure, we've got to provide clothes for people who need clothing and so on. Sure, of course, of course. But that's not our job. Our job is to seek and save the lost. That's our job. Our mission is to witness against the evil in the world, not to take care of all the evil in the world. Our task is to warn about the judgment that's coming. That's our job. Nobody else has got that job. Who else has got that job? Does the government have the task of warning society about the judgment of God to come? Is that the job of our president, of our governor? No, that's our job, that's our task. The problem, of course, is how do we maintain this Christ-centered culture in the church that exists in an ever-changing, ever more complex, ever more multicultural nation and world? Well, as I finish up my lesson, let me suggest several ways we can do this. Maintaining the culture of Christ in the church requires, first of all, that we hold fast to the word of God as God's word. Second Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 16, the Bible presents us with God's word couched in an ancient Jewish cultural context. Our task, says author Duane Friesen, is to make it relevant to a 21st century multicultural audience. That's what we have to do. There will always be an attempt to define God's word in simply cultural terms. I mean, this is the approach of the higher critics who hold sway in major universities today. This is simply culture defining culture, explaining divinity in simply cultural terms. 
I expect this from those who only see religion as the product of culture. They can't see it any other way. But when we define the Bible or parts of of the Bible, as some in the church are beginning to do, when we define parts of the Bible in simply cultural terms, without acknowledging its transcendent nature, we dilute its power and we frustrate God's effort to reveal Christ to the world. Without the inspired word of Christ, there cannot be a culture of Christ. Why would there be if it's not inspired? God's word is fashioned from culture and history and language, but we must never lose sight of the fact that he uses these things to reveal himself to mankind. For us to maintain the culture of Christ in the church, we must maintain the key teaching that the Bible is a book from God, not a book from man. Number two, how to maintain the culture of Christ within the church. We need to actually preach the gospel. In Galatians chapter one, verse six to eight, Paul says, oh, imagine we were doing this in class. I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. In the early church, this was a distinguishing mark of the culture of Christ that existed in what we refer to as New Testament Christianity. The early church that we today in the churches of Christ try to replicate in the modern age, if you ever wondered, what's the church of Christ? What are we trying to do? How are we different? We're trying to replicate the New Testament church in the 21st century. That's our historical mission, not our, biblical, not our biblical mission. And so the early church proclaimed the message as a way of establishing and maintaining their new identity or their culture as Christians. How did we know they were Christians? They were the ones preaching the gospel. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> To truly establish New Testament Christianity and reproduce that type of church culture requires us today to do exactly the same thing. We think that reproducing the culture of Christ is by focusing only on the forms for public worship and church organization. And we've spent the last century arguing over these while entire generations and cultures perish without the gospel around us. Think now, think for a second, come on. That we only sing in public worship or that only the men preach. Okay, this is important and it's biblically accurate, but it is secondary and in service to the task of actually proclaiming the gospel to the lost. I mean, I've heard countless sermons, read numerous books and articles that define New Testament Christianity, which is another term for the culture of Christ, as something that conforms to certain ways of doing things, especially in public worship, or how to handle money, or how to use the building. But so few put the actual proclamation of the gospel as one of the defining attributes of the New Testament church. We're not the New Testament church because we, 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 we take communion every Sunday, although that's one feature of the New Testament church. We're the New Testament church because we're actually proclaiming the gospel to the world. That's an imposing mark of the culture of Christ. But so few put the actual proclamation of the gospel as one of the defining attributes of the New Testament church. If this were so, how many could say that the culture of Christ exists in their congregation? For example, you may have the number of cups at communion rite, and maybe you don't use a piano in the building, but if the proclamation of the gospel is not first and foremost in your church culture, those other things don't really matter much in the big picture. I mean, the other part of this point is the gospel itself. Maintaining the gospel, excuse me, maintaining the culture of Christ in the church requires us to preach the gospel. You know, the gospel that's in the Bible, you know that gospel? 
I heard a young Baptist preacher at a funeral a little while back, uh, preaching away, you know, the funeral sermon. And he was thinking that he was actually preaching the quote, the gospel to those who were in attendance because he recited the sinner's prayer at the end in his eulogy for the deceased. You know, he talked about the deceased. He was this guy and that guy, and he was the great guy, and blah, 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 blah. And now, uh, uh, accept Jesus in your heart and you'll be saved. And he thought, wow, I preach the gospel to these people. Or perhaps our Pentecostal or charismatic friends who call on the Holy Spirit to fall on somebody. But before we get too smug, how many times have we heard from our own pulpits, preachers and teachers who proclaim things that they are passing off as the gospel? For example, that we are the true church, therefore repent and be baptized. Or that baptism is by immersion, therefore repent and be baptized. Or that salvation has five steps, so learn these, memorize these, oh and by the way, repent and be baptized. And we wonder why many times churches are shrinking and there's no joy in many of our, our congregations and why people aren't growing spiritually. The gospel is what produces the culture of Christ in the church. That gospel, this gospel, this good news. We're a saved people. We are a congregation of the redeemed. We are the saints in light. Those who are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. This is our culture. This is our heritage. This is our life experience as Christians. And this culture has been made possible by what the gospel announces. Listen carefully now. Listen carefully now. That while we were helplessly lost and condemned to eternal suffering because of our sins, God, because of His grace, chose to save us using a system of faith and not a system of law. Isn't that good news? I go to heaven not because I get everything right. I go to heaven not because I do everything correctly. I go to heaven not because I manage to, manage to do everything perfectly. I go to heaven because I believe. That's good news because I couldn't get there in any other way. God only asks me what I'm able to do. I can't be perfect. I can't get it all right. I can't understand it all sometimes, but I can believe. I can believe that I can do. I can change my ways. Yeah, that I can do. I can let somebody bury me in the water. Yeah, I can do that. That's good news, that's good news. I am reborn because I believe, not because I am perfect or because I belong to a certain class or culture or gender. Look carefully through the New Testament and you'll note that the battles that Paul and Peter fought to preserve the integrity of the gospel were efforts to pressure this good news against attempts to add works of the law. Isn't that what we were talking about in class this morning? Against attempts to impose traditions or introduce rituals or imprison with restrictions. All attempts to bring some earthly cultural impurity into the pristine message of the gospel. At this point, someone will say, well, wait a minute now. What about repentance? What about baptism? Am I, am I promoting some sort of Baptist or evangelical doctrine? Of course not. Repentance, confession of Christ, immersion into Christ through baptism, faithful living. These are the response. This is the biblical response to the good news. But they are not in themselves the good news, do you understand what I'm explaining? Proclaiming the gospel is not teaching that baptism is by immersion. I mean, baptism is by immersion in water, but that's not the good news. I mean, who cares? That don't do nothing for me. That don't do nothing for me. How am I, you know, how am I uh, blessed by, by being immersed in the water? That don't do nothing for me, that's not the gospel. 
The gospel is not deciding the level of repentance that I need to make before I can become a Christian. That's not good news. Or understanding that perhaps the church of Christ is a New Testament church. Well, yeah, it is a New Testament church, but that fact is not the gospel. That's not the good news. Or that you know, proper worship does not use instruments of, uh, of music. Well, that's true, but that's not the good news. Never, no one ever got saved because of that. All these things may be true and accurate biblically, but they don't have the power to save. They don't have the power to transform lives or to create the culture of Christ in the church or in a person's heart. But constantly, aggressively, lovingly proclaiming what God has done through Christ to save you and why, this is the gospel. Brothers and sisters, if we want to build the church and, and counter the influence of the worldly culture that surrounds it, we must create the culture of Christ by making sure that we're proclaiming the same gospel that the apostles proclaimed. We're not going to turn the world upside down unless we proclaim to it the good news of Jesus Christ. That's the only way that happens. I could go on and on about maintaining the culture of Christ in the church as a way of dealing with the effects of culture outside the church, but I add only one more to the two that I've already mentioned. Maintaining the culture of Christ in the church requires keeping the inspired word inspired and preaching the gospel that's actually in the Bible to the world, that's two. And then the third one is we must lead holy lives. Oh dear, now we're, did he have to get personal? <laughs> Could we not have just kept it at the meta level, you know, the meta message? Do we have to go now to the you know, micro message? I've argued that we can't leave our culture. We can't separate ourselves from it because we are all one way or another part of culture. However, we can stand out in the culture we belong to because of Christ. This is what holiness looks like against the backdrop of culture. It is, it is a bright red rose on a dark gray background. It is a skyscraper among lesser buildings. It is the smell of freshly mowed grass that surprises you as you drive by on a summer afternoon. The Bible says it this way. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then, but now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. What? What's he saying? He wants me to be like him. He doesn't want me. He doesn't want me to be a better version of me. See, that's what I'm trying to do all the time. I'm trying to be a better version of me. He doesn't want that. He wants me to be like him. There's a difference. There's a difference to that. Of course, the Bible explains in detail what holy living entails. Sexual purity, oh dear, really? Yeah, yeah. Speaking the truth in love, continuing faithfully in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayer, all of this is holy living. The Bible is filled with teaching and examples of holy living, but in regards to culture, holiness is the way that we stand out from culture as both a witness against the corruption within culture and as a preview of the culture of Christ, which is to come. A powerful example of this culture of Christ, standing head and shoulders above the contemporary culture of our day, occurred in Pennsylvania in October the 2nd, 2006. On that day, Charles Carl Roberts, who was a milkman, walked into a one-room schoolroom in the Amish community and murdered five little girls between the age of six and 13 years. 
before taking his own life. We've seen this type of thing happen since in our culture and how society has handled these kinds of tragedies. What do they do? We have vigils, candle lighting, psychological counseling, uh, uh, the call for new and stiffer gun laws and the tabloid frenzy uh, to know all about the shooter. But in the Amish girls shooting, there was a different kind of response that stood out from anything before or since in this type of situation. For example, the killer's family reported, this is the killer's family reported that only hours after the shooting, their family received visits from the Amish community to provide them with comfort and forgiveness. One Amish man literally held the shooter's father in his arms while the grieving dad sobbed. Think for a minute to be the mother or the father of someone who did such a thing. Could you imagine that your child, your baby that you nursed, your boy that you played ball with as a little boy who hugged you and said, Daddy, I love you. you know, that little boy grew up into this man that would do this horrible thing to other people's children. Think now how you would feel at that moment. The, 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 the Amish community then did several things that made them stand out among others in similar uh, situations. They invited the Roberts widow to attend the murdered girl's funerals and, and she, the, the wife of the murderer, she read a letter of apology on behalf of her family. And then 30 people from the Amish community then attended the funeral for the killer. And then the Amish community set up a charitable fund for the family of the shooter, also for the girls, but also for the family of the shooter, since he left behind a widow and three children. They were innocent, they didn't do anything. They not only lost their father and their supporter, the husband, they also lost their reputation and their life. You see, this is holiness. This is what stands out. This is the culture of Christ shining forth despite the Amish's self-imposed religious culture of 18th century clothing and transportation. You forgot about the buggy and you forgot about the buggies and the horses and the funny clothes. And you forgot about all of that business among the Amish and you only saw this perfect love of Christ shining forth at that terrible dark moment. You know that red rose against the dark sky. That was these people. And so in clothing, let, 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 let me just emphasize the idea that our response to the influence of culture on the church is not to try to Christianize culture, forget that. Our task, as Paul explains in Romans 12 verse two, is to resist culture's effort to de-Christianize the church. And we do this in practical terms, as I mentioned by proclaiming the Bible as God's word, by preaching what the Bible actually teaches is the good news, and by uh, preserving holy living as the culture of Christ in every generation. And if we do these things, we will do our part in guaranteeing that the effects of culture will not overpower uh, the church as Jesus has promised us in Matthew. And so if you have not yet responded to the gospel preached here by expressing your belief in Jesus and expressing that faith through repentance and baptism, or if you have fallen away from the holy lifestyle that reflects the culture of Christ that we strive for in his church, then we encourage you this morning to come forward now for baptism, for restoration, whatever you may need as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.